Item 3.2, Vice Chancellor <laughs> Troy on budget triggers. Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning, uh, President Himmelstein, Chancellor Scott, and uh, members. Uh, so this uh, item had originally been uh, proposed to focus ex exclusively on the budget triggers, which you know were, were, were enacted in December. Uh, due to the surprise release, uh, surprise even apparently to the governor uh, last week of the 12-13 budget, I think I'll also use a lot of my time to talk about that as well if, uh, with your uh, approval. Um, uh, firstly, to go over the triggers, as, as I've described in earlier communications and at the uh, in prior board meetings, uh, with the passage of the 11-12 budget, uh, there was a great deal of uncertainty about some of the revenue assumptions that were included as part of that agreement in order to make the plan uh, financeable to the market to borrow the cash needed to fund um, uh, ongoing activities, the budget included a series of triggers that provided that if revenues were short of uh, estimations by certain criteria, by certain uh, marks, uh, that that would entail certain reductions, automatic reductions to the budget. Uh, if the, for the community colleges, if revenues were found to be a billion dollars short of uh, the budget assumptions, that would entail a what we call a tier one cut that's a $30 million reduction, and also that will increase the fees that we charge uh, as of this coming summer from $36 per unit to $46 per unit. The tier two trigger, which was to be pulled if uh, revenues were found to be $2 billion short of estimate, would be in, in addition to that tier one cut, we would have a, a $72 million reduction that would be uh, permanent until that time that uh, future budgets can uh, backfill that cost. So the Department of Finance in December found that revenues were about $2.2 billion short of estimates. So both the tier one and tier two triggers were pulled for us. So that's a total current year reduction to our system of $102 million. Now, um, in the, for future years, we would anticipate that that increase in uh, fee revenue would be able to backfill at least that, uh, that tier one $30 million hit. Uh, but the $72 million hit is an ongoing workload reduction for the system. So until we have future budgets where revenues are strong enough that we can uh, uh, afford to start truly reinvesting in higher education, colleges should plan for those cuts to be ongoing. Uh, I, I would say given my conversations with uh, administrators, CBOs, over, since the budget was passed, we urge them to be cautious that until those dollars came in that uh, uh, you could not count on spending them. Uh, my understanding in talking to most colleges is that they, they budgeted very cautiously uh, with uh, they were more or less resigned to the fact that at least the tier one, if not both uh, tier two triggers would be pulled. So I, I think most colleges were, um, were prepared for that uh, eventuality. So that, is, uh, that brought the total general fund hit to um, our system for the 11-12 year to about $502 million. So it's a major, major disinvestment in higher education, which we hope future budgets will begin to reverse. Uh, having said that, I'll move on to the 12-13 uh, proposal. Or can I, can I ask question? one, one yes. question Please. on the tuition increases? Does the language say that those dollars actually come back to us or as in Prop 98, it goes to the general fund? Well, it does come back to us, so the, the fees do mitigate the cuts for okay. the colleges. Now, okay. obviously, that's painful for the students because it comes on their sure. their backs. But the, the but the revenue does come back to the system. Okay, Member McDougal. <laughs> Dan, I, I, it would be extremely helpful, I think, if as a board uh, we were able to get information that shows the effect of the ten dollar fee increase on student enrollment. And uh, I think that's particularly challenging in this environment. <coughs> because we have such a demand uh, that is not being served already. <clears throat> but it was quite uh, vivid in the past that when fees went up even a moderate amount, the effect on enrollment was not insubstantial. And I know we have the grants, et cetera, but oftentimes individuals don't get by looking at what the size of the fee is and what's it's going to cost to understand how they might meet that increase. So my request specifically is, can we ascertain the consequences of the fee going up from 36 to $46? That's a substantial increase 
uh, on a per unit fee basis. And uh, I think we need to know how it's affecting enrollment. Uh, Member McDougall, I think for the, for the next board meeting, I can see if I can prepare some analysis of that for you. Uh, mm -hmm. I would note it is difficult to tease out uh, or isolate some of these issues. Uh, due to the workload reductions, colleges have to pull yeah. back their, uh, their enrollment uh, under any circumstances. So it's, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to attribute uh, you know, whether the reduction in FTES is going to be because of the fees or because of the colleges on the natural not able to provide all the core sections. But we can put together some, uh, some information for you that I think might be helpful. Yeah, I recognize that. I wasn't expecting really any information until we look at summer enrollment because it would seem to me that <clears throat> that's a point at which the fee will be implemented. And it's when the, the fee is implemented where the consequence will be uh, felt. So I, I, I mean, I don't need anything in a month. I'm, I'm looking more at uh, what, it happens, what will happen uh, at the enrollment period. And I concur with you, it's getting it more and more difficult to tease it out because of the unmet demand that exists already. Yeah. Should be noted with the, with the fee increase to $46 effective in uh, summer session, Right. This year, that's a, a roughly 77% increase in yeah. fees in just over a year. We've gone from 26 to 46 yeah. uh, in a hurry. Chancellor Scott. Yeah. I think it was Yogi Berra who said it's very difficult uh, to predict, particularly if it relates to the future. So uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how this is going to uh, impact. Um, one thing I think there's a, that in the past, there's a greater knowledge of the financial aid that's available. Uh, I don't have the percentage of those who get the BOG fee waiver, but I think it's over 50% uh, that get the BOG fee waiver. So whenever the fee goes up, they are still, uh, <clears throat> they have a tuition fee waiver. Uh, there is such a thing as we all know called sticker shock. And that is when the uninformed person is not aware of the financial aid available, uh, they are, uh, frightened by the increase. Uh, fortunately, the California Community Colleges still happen to be uh, the lowest tuition in the nation, even with the $46. Um, and uh, it's not that we view that uh, uh, with a, a great deal of joy at all. That's about $1,380, I believe, uh, for someone who takes 30 units in a year's time. Uh, so we are, we work very aggressively in terms of giving Pell Grants, Cal Grants, and of course the uh, Board of Governors fee waiver. Um, and uh, uh, we just don't know. Of course, the demand is so great out there uh, that I, I don't think there's going to be a dip in enrollment except for the dip that the state, when they, when they cut, uh, cut us in terms of funding, they reduce our cap. And so most of the reduction in the enrollment that has occurred uh, system-wide has been deliberate, frankly. I mean, they, they can't afford to educate students beyond their cap. And so as a result of that, they've offered a lot fewer course sections. Still, there's uh, uh, quite a number of students that are being educated for which we get no remuneration other than maybe the tuition that they happen to pay. So. Uh, we will be glad to work on that, but, but those are a few of the comments I would make that I think uh, the demand is so great, the awareness of financial aid is pretty much out there by now, and uh, unfortunately there may be some students who simply hear the, uh, the word and they're frightened uh, over it. Um, so that's, that's about all I can say. Member Baum. I have two questions. One is the are there any districts, in your opinion, that did not prepare sufficiently for the trigger that uh, we're going to have to keep a pretty close look at in the coming months? Well, I, I have only anecdotal information on that. As you know, we don't get their audit reports until well after uh, the fiscal year uh, has ended. And I think we, uh, at any, almost at any given time, you'll have a few districts that are having some fiscal difficulty. Uh, the board, uh, with the board's approval, we did take some steps this year to help uh, alleviate the cost for the smaller districts who don't have the uh, economies of scale to handle a, uh, a workload reduction as well as some of the larger districts may have. And uh, my, my understanding is that a lot of the smaller districts uh, benefited greatly uh, from that, that approach. So I think we help uh, stave off perhaps some of the worst of the damage that might have otherwise have occurred. So you'll keep us posted if there's 
any Absolutely. districts that are working Absolutely. on that. And there's no question that as, as time goes on, if these cuts mm -hmm. continue to be uh, sustained, I think we have some, uh, particularly some of our smaller districts who may have trouble uh, making ends meet. My other question, I sit on the audit committee for my district, and with respect to the BOG fee waiver, um, there was an audit line that actual, do districts shoulder the costs for the BOG fee, fee waiver, or is there apportionment support backfilling of that? Uh, the uh, state is supposed to backfill that, that, those funds with general fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, our fear for the 11-12 year was that they may have overestimated the amount of fees Mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to collect, and that results in a shortage in general funds. So we may have a, a, a deficit in the 11-12 year uh, based on that shortage. Right. I don't think it's a, a severe shortage, but I think it is notable. Well, it was. It struck me because I saw that the districts. We have a line where we're funding the uh, the bog fee waiver through the district, and so a a <coughs> fee increase that's not backed filled by the uh, the state actually adds an additional financial burden to the districts to meet that uh, fee waiver, especially as you indicated, more than 50% of our students uh, qualify for the fee waiver, and maybe more will after that. Yeah, That's right, and I, I think the good news is, we're, and we're still getting some of the detail in from the Department of Finance at this point. We haven't had the probably the time we'd like to really provide, get a very thorough analysis of that backup, but uh, it does appear that their intent is to try to backfill right. uh, that, uh, that waived those waived fees they've uh, they've uh, significantly increased their estimates of the number of students that will um, get a bog fee waiver and provided the, the general fund backfill to account for that mm -hmm. so we're hopeful that that will help stave off a deficit in 12 13. thank you please proceed okay if you will i'll go on to the uh, 12 13 budget proposal um, so the, the, uh, the governor had a press conference on Thursday to announce uh, uh, his January proposal. Uh, the supporting detail shows a 12-13 overall budget deficit of about $9.2 billion. Uh, about a little over $4 billion of that is carryover of the 11-12 deficit. So from an operational standpoint, the 12-13 uh, the budget deficit is about $5 billion. Uh, that is a significant improvement over what we've seen in, in recent years where we had uh, operational deficits in the neighborhood of 20 billion. Uh, indeed, uh, even without major policy changes, additional, whether that be additional cuts or revenues, uh, the Department of Finance does show by the 14, 15 year that that operational deficit would be down to a little below $2 billion. So it's been a, uh, a painful ride. A lot of cuts uh, have, been, uh, have been enacted in order to uh, help restore some balance to the state budget but between those cuts and a slowly recovering economy, uh, it does appear that the state is uh, very slowly getting on a, on, on a better fiscal footing as we go into the future. Um, with that, there are cost obligations that the governor is interested in funding, including education. Uh, with that in mind, he's proposing a November ballot initiative, which he says will be $6.9 billion. That will be an increase in uh, the income tax for uh, filers who earn 250,000 or more, uh, and also an increase in the sales tax for a half a percentage point over, I believe, a four-year period to uh, help provide some new revenues both to education and to uh, backfill other holes in the budget. Um, for, the, for the community colleges specifically, uh, the governor does uh, essentially fund business as usual. He moves the 11-12 obligations and they fully fund those dollars without providing any growth, any COLA, any restoration of categorical programs, so mostly business as usual. Uh, he does add $218 million in a deferral buyback, which I'm not sure everyone is familiar with that, but um, what our system has had for several years now are uh, deferrals, where money, programmatic dollars that we're supposed to receive in the current year are pushed into early into the next fiscal year. It's sort of an accounting gimmick, so districts have to borrow that money to pay for the, uh, to bridge uh, that deferral to pay for the current year obligations. Uh, what the, we, our system has a total of $961 million right now of, of deferrals. Uh, this is, uh, K-12 is in the same boat as we are in this regard. What the, what the governor proposes to do with this $218 million is buy back some of that deferral, so reduce that, uh, clean up the accounting a little bit, uh, if you will. So this would not actually be new cash 
that the districts can spend on new program. It's really just uh, tidying up the uh, account a bit. So one thing we may want to consider as a system as we move forward uh, through this long budget process is whether this is really the time to clean up that, that accounting process or if it's not a time to restore some of our uh, system deficits. Um, if the uh, revenues do not pass, we would be, get, be subject to another trigger cut. It would be two years in a row of budgeting uncertainty for our, our districts. Um, if the uh, revenues do not pass, we would lose that $218 million. Plus, the governor proposes that the system would have to absorb the, uh, the state general uh, obligation debt service that, we've, that has been incurred due to the passage of prior uh, statewide bonds. Uh, essentially, those costs that are right now outside of our budget would be moved into our budget. It looks like uh, for the community colleges that cost obligation would be about $260 million. So what that effectively, effectively does is it squeezes out uh, programmatic, programmatic expenditures of that magnitude within the system. So it's a programmatic cut essentially of that $260 million uh, to take on that obligation. So that is uh, effectively for districts a cut. Uh, there are some other interesting pr features of the uh, proposal. The governor does say also contingent on the passage of this um, revenue proposal that um, uh, that he his, it's his intent to fund higher education, including uh, community colleges, UC and CSU, at uh, at least uh, provide increases of at least four percent annually beginning the 2013-14 year through the 2015-16 year, and he does indicate. Um, uh, a willingness to take a look at the Student Success Task Force recommendations and look for other ways to provide our system with operational uh, flexibility. Uh, he does seem to be interested both uh, not only in higher ed but throughout state government and uh, ceding a little more control to locals and uh, holding them accountable for uh, outcomes. So I think uh, we don't have a lot of detail yet on what he's proposing in that regard, but I think there's uh, more to come as the year goes on. Uh, another important feature I should add of is uh, the 12-13 budget proposal is he proposes to consolidate most categorical programs and allow districts flexibility in how those funds are used. Uh, we're told that um, when the budget language come out that, that a couple of those programs will be protected, uh, but by and large uh, he intends to provide very broad flexibility for districts in terms of how he spends those categorical dollars. Uh, so with that, I think that concludes my summary and I uh, await questions. Yeah, um, uh, two, two things. Um, one, when does the budget language come out? The specifics? Uh, I, 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 think the, I think the governor was taken by surprise right. with his release, so I, I think we'll see budget bills within the next week or two. Okay. And there we, we can see much more of the specific provisional language right. there. The second part of that is you say that in the 12-13, budget year, the structural deficit, so to speak, go, is about $5 billion, right? Not structural, but the ongoing. Yeah, the uh, operational. That, that, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is the governor is basically holding community college colleges harmless, right, for our portion of that $5 billion going forward, that, at least in, yeah. That, that's right. So he's... Um, he, he certainly is putting, making it clear to voters that education gets it if they, if they don't uh, pass the, the, the uh, revenue package in November. Then, so then we we'll, are, we'll social our, services is hit, uh, health and human services, for example, gets a $2 billion cut. Child care is hit very hard in his proposal. Right. And education is pro provided modest increases in the Prop 98 guarantee. Uh, those go away and then some if the revenue package doesn't pass in November. Board member questions? Thank you very much. I have a feeling we'll be having uh, quite a bit in, of back and forth coming coming up. This is just the beginning, yes. Uh, uh, sir. Wasn't it uh, indicated that if the package doesn't pass, that K through 12 would suffer, that w would be five weeks shorter than it was before? Was it five three weeks? weeks? Three weeks, I'm I sorry. Think he, I think he says three weeks, I think just as an example of what the magnitude of the cut is. He's not specifically proposing yeah. to cut the school year by three weeks. Uh, I, I suspect most uh, districts would try to get by on so, reserves and other yeah. minor so, cuts. So Dan, what that really means is uh, 
Well, but yeah, that's right. The new fiscal year starts sep September, right, or October? Uh, July, October? 1. July 1. July 1, sorry. So, so moving forth for July 1, we're funded as if the extra revenue is there. Correct. Uh, so obviously, if, uh, if, if a budget is passed as the governor proposes, yeah. I will be urging districts to budget with caution. Right, <laughs> right. Okay, any other comments from board members? Very nice job, Dan. Thank you, Thank you. very much.